After retracing the flight path of early Spanish and Filipino aviators in Madrid, I found myself in the windswept plains of central Spain, where I trailed in the steps of another celebrated, though fictional adventurer, Don Quixote de la Mancha. Join us as we go on noble quest to find the best this side of Spain has to offer. Very good. bustling city of Madrid, I drive south to the fertile plains of Castilla-La Mancha. Its wide, open roads and beautiful countryside is reason enough to go for a road trip. Driving on unfamiliar highways is easy thanks to intuitive and user-friendly navigation systems. Please follow the road for 800 meters which brought me to the setting of Don Quixote's many adventures, Castilla-La Mancha. The region is named for many castles dotting its landscape. Tagus River, the longest in the Iberian Peninsula, runs through its capital, the ancient city of Toledo. It's a site that takes you back in time. Entered the old city walls of Toledo through Puente de Alcantara, an art bridge built by the Romans when they founded the town in the Middle Ages. Roman historians describe Toledo as a small city in a fortified location, which explains why it successively became the seat of power of different empires. The historical coexistence of Christians, Muslims, and Jews gave Toledo the nickname, the City of Three Cultures. On top of Toledo's highest point, stands the Alcazar, a fortress that has become a symbol of Spanish nationalism. Toledo used to be the capital of Spain. King Carlos V had the Alcazar built to be his royal residence. However, even before it was finished, they moved the capital to Madrid, and therefore he never had a chance to live here. During the 1936 Spanish Civil War, one of the most inspiring battles happened here when nationalist colonel Jose Moscardo Ituarte managed to defend the fort despite the relentless attempts of the Republicans. And even after they kidnapped and killed his son in the hopes of forcing his surrender, the Alcazar was later on renovated and now serves as a reminder of its defenders' bravery and patriotism. Going further back in time, I stepped into Toledo's main square, Plaza Socodover. Socodover means place for animals, and during the Arab period, this is where they sold their cattle, or it was like a souk. I can almost imagine the place bustling with commercial activity, with traders ready to sell off their goats and cows in exchange for other wares. Today, trading is as easy as falling in line for some fast food. Just across the main square, I catch a whiff of some baked goods. My keen sense of smell has led me to the 160-year-old confectionery of Santo Tomé. 
This bakery is known for the traditional Spanish sweet marzipan, popular in this region. They say that I can't get out of here without buying this marzipan. And she says, this is the best. I think I can't wait. I have to eat one. <laughs> very good. Very good. Marzipan has a very long history, dating back to medieval times, and its origin is still widely debated. But Spanish historians say it was invented by nuns in Toledo during a time of Great Famine 800 years ago. Out of their abundant produce of sugar and almonds, they concocted just the perfect source of energy for the undernourished people of the city. Here in Toledo, it's nice to walk around the little alleys and see the different shops. Toledo has a distinct medieval charm, a place where the gallant Don Quixote would have enjoyed walking around it, looking for damsels in distress. Of course, he would think it's the best place to find a bladed weapon fit for a Spanish caballero. They say that the best swords come from Toledo. Even during the Roman and medieval period, they would love to have swords coming from here. The imperial city has a very long history of sword making. Toledo blades, composed of an interior iron core covered in steel, are unparalleled in flexibility and strength. It was the Roman legion's choice of weaponry, even in ancient times, and even some of today's modern-day armies still source their weapons here. Toledo swordsmiths have a unique skill in tempering steel passed on to their children for generations. Its many shops offer visitors a chance to take home a piece of the city's glorious past. Being experts at metallurgy, Toledans have also perfected the delicate art of the basquinado or damascene decorating steel with threads of gold or silver. The art is traced back to Damascus in modern-day Syria, brought to Spain by ancient trade. Today, Toledo is the largest producer of this kind of wares. Its designs range from arabesque or geometric patterns to renaissance with bird and flower motifs. But what good are these plates without any food? I think this should be my next quest. When we come back, we travel across the Castilian Plains for a taste of the region's bountiful harvest. Castilla-La Mancha is the largest wine-producing region in the world. With over 400,000 hectares of land covered with vineyards. From Toledo, I travel further south to visit Finca Antigua, an old estate in Los Hinosos. With an expansive vineyard on one side and a modern building on the other, I felt like entering a top-secret facility. I was warmly welcomed by two gentlemen who looked like secret agents, Jose and Loren. Hi, Joy. How are you doing? Bienvenido. Bienvenido a Fingantigua. ¿Qué tal estás? Hi, Joy. Bienvenido. I'm happy to have you here. We'll show you everything around. Finca Antigua is one of the estates of the Familia Martinez Buhanda, a family that has been growing and making wines for 125 years. I was astounded by the vastness of the estate, and Jose says the land is thriving with wild boars, hares, and other wild animals, 
which means that no pesticides are used. From here you can see everything is, is green. <laughs> green and it's nature, no? Mm. Loren, the vineyard's chief winemaker, gives me a closer look. It seems like the whole mountain is uh, filled with rocks, rocky uh, soil, huh? Yeah, this is a, a special area. It's not just natural. It's, it's natural rocks, it's calcium soil, very poor in organic material, but very, very interesting for vineyard. If you are talking about to, to cultivate another plants, Maybe not it's, so good. it's not so good. But for the trees, olive trees, uh, for the vineyard, it's the best one, the soil. Yeah. Now is the moment that the, the, the rave is changing the color. Right. In Spain, it's uh, called it embero. Embero. Where the red rays come from to the green. Yeah. Okay. More or less, since the embero to the beginning is about uh, one month. At an altitude of almost 1,000 meters, the higher solar radiation and the lower temperatures give the wines a more concentrated flavor. Lauren explains that the quality of their wines depends solely on the fruit, but they can achieve different flavors by manipulating different factors in its fermentation. So here, all you do is control uh, by computers in your control room all the different settings that you want. Yes, because in the alcoholic fermentation it's very important to control the temperature and the uh, pumping uh, process yes. to extract the flowers, uh, the color and all the tannins from the skins and the pips. Then the wines are aged in barrels. Depending on the type of wine, they use either American or French oak. Your cellar is very nice. You even have rocks here. Yes, we are preserving the humidity of this uh, pavilion with these natural rocks because the uh, oak uh, lose some wine right. if the humidity is very, very low. You lose money. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Above these rocks is the water reservoir we saw coming in earlier, which aside from irrigating the vineyard, doubles as a cooling system that keeps temperature stable in this room throughout the year. From the barrels, the wine is bottled. But unlike French wines that have to be stored before opening, Spanish wines are kept in storage before they are sold. So they are ready to be enjoyed. Jose and Lauren takes me to the tasting room, an old, lovely farmhouse looking over the plains of La Mancha. And which one is this, Jose? So this is Finca Antigua Viura. Uh, this right. is actually, yeah, Lauren can tell it, it's in the highest score in the, in the region, 91 Parker points. Wow. Four. Wow. Very fresh. Very fresh and clean. You can enjoy it now, fresh or aged as well. Their dessert wine is a naturally sweet variant aptly called Naturalmente Dulce. More fruity on this one. Very yes, dangerous. More right? fruity than mm. dangerous. You get addicted. Yeah. <laughs> you really enjoy it. Um, very fresh on the side. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Please enjoy it. Always with uh, with good friends. Yes. Mm -hmm. Family. Makes a lot of difference. It makes yeah. a big difference. <laughs> there were still places to be explored. In a traveling night, knows his limits. If there's anything I know about wine, is that it's best enjoyed with a food pairing. Luckily for me, La Mancha is the origin of the world-famous Manchego cheese. Sounds like another noble quest for this errant night. In this part of Spain, it all boils down to tradition. La Antigua Queseria complements Manchego's long history with three generations dedicated cheese making. I was shown around the factory by third generation cheese maker Juan David Fernandez. It continues to be a small family-run business. I discovered some unique ways that set Manchego apart from other cheeses. First, 
They use only milk from the manchega sheep found in the region. Second, the curd is molded in special barrels, a modern version of the former esparto grass baskets that leave a distinct zigzag pattern on the rind. And lastly, they are aged for two months to two years, depending on the kind of manchego. These are coated in vegetable paint to protect them from bacteria. I felt overwhelmed by all the cheese around me, and I wondered, do you still like eating cheese? Si, master. Si? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> i tell you a secret. Okay. He has a daughter. Yes. She's about five years old. And yes. she said, you know, daddy and mommy, I'm the cheese princess. Yeah. <laughs> His daughter loves eating cheese. And I can definitely understand why. 90 days. 90 days. has 90 days. Nice. And this one is raw milk without any process. No se pasteriza. This is one year no, old. No, 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 no. Mm. Nine months. It's good too. <laughs> Muy bien. Is it correct? Awesome. <laughs> awesome. A first sight, mm -hmm. it, it, they look the, the same. same. Yeah. But the flavor yeah. is, is different. Manchego sharp but subtle nuttiness made me want to be a cheese king myself. El Quijote, the Quixote. Yeah. They, they talk about food and the manchega cheese. It's mentioned. It's mentioned there. Yes. Because it was easy a long time to transport this kind of food. Mm -hmm. You can put it in a bag. Yes. And it, is a, it, it doesn't need a fridge. So if Don Quixote can eat this, I can eat it too. <laughs> <laughs> it was an intelligent guy. <laughs> Aside from its long shelf life, Manchego has a creamy and melt-in-your-mouth flavor that pleasantly lingers on the palate. No wonder it was Don Quixote's choice of food during his adventures. Up next, I conclude my quest through central Spain, coming face to face with the giants of La Mancha. My quest to retrace the steps of Don Quixote de la Mancha leads me to the small town of El Toboso, a quiet village of only 2,000 inhabitants. There is no Spanish icon more famous than the man from La Mancha himself, Don Quixote, who is seen here with his beloved Dulcinea, who comes from the town of El Toboso. The town's only claim to fame is that it's the hometown of the fictional character Dulcinea, a simple farm girl whom Don Quixote envisioned as a noble woman to whom he dedicated his quests. I met some young kids at the town plaza who practically grew up in Don Quixote country. So is uh, Don Quixote really popular here in your town? Yes, yes. Uh, will anyone from the boys become Don Quixote? No. He, he, he. He will be the one. Yes. You play Pokemon Go? Pokemon Go? Pokemon Go? I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? It seems that the times have caught up, even with his small town. But the story is kept alive by many of its residents. I met Isabella one of the town's innkeepers, who was more than willing to share her passion for Spain's literary icon. Though my Spanish was rusty, I felt how passionate she was about the novel. Dibujos. Yes. De las cañas. Oh, Hand-painted. Sí, sí. Sí. Para, y el artista que nos ha copiado este The novel is the second most translated book in the world, next to the Bible. She even shows me it's Filipino translation. And mira, aquí está copiado en Tagalog. Oh, in Tagalog. Acercarnos un poco también al paisaje filipino. 400 years ago, Spanish writer Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra wrote the book, The Ingenious Gentleman, Don Quixote of La Mancha. 
a story about Alonso Quijano, who after reading so many romance novels, loses his wits and sets off as a knight named Don Quixote. With his squire, a common peasant named Sancho Panza, he rides his horse, Rocinante, to bring justice to the world. All his battles, he dedicated to an unknowing farm girl, Dulcinea del Toboso. <laughs> his story brought about the term quixotic or exceedingly idealistic, sometimes to the point of being foolish. Sounds familiar? Like him, I also have big ambitions and the overwhelming passion to go on adventures and make my dreams come true. Something most people can relate to. Before I knew it, <laughs> she was leading me to a room full of Don Quixote's possessions. Por eso lo más codiciado es el defute de música. Es canarios? Absolutamente. <laughs> now, I really feel like I'm Don Quixote. I just have to look for my horse, Rocinante. <laughs> then, I try to channel the Cervantes in me and impress everyone with my writing. <laughs> I'm ready to go back to the Philippines and uh, write my own story. But not before I get to have one last exotic adventure. I continue on my journey and was thankful that I didn't have a sickly horse to ride, but a nice, reliable car that can take me through La Mancha's dusty plains. I drive to the town of Consegra, where Don Quixote fought his most notable enemies, the windmills of La Mancha. Lost in his own world, he mistakes his windmills as giants and battles them, only to be thrown off his horse. It is from here that they coined the English idiom, tilting at windmills, which means attacking imaginary enemies or wasting time worrying about problems that do not exist. Something that a lot of people tend to do. If anything, these were innocent giant millers used to grind grain in use until the 1980s. Their practical use may be gone, but they will always be the iconic giants that Don Quixote fought, representing our life's many battles. After exploring Castilla La Mancha, I understood why it was the perfect setting for Don Quixote's quests. Here lies a land that has not only survived, but thrived in harsh environments to produce abundant yields. It endured successive conquests and bore proud people of widely diverse cultures, but are united in upholding traditions. My quest back in time has made me more appreciative of the present and fueled my desire to go on for many more adventures. This has been your captain, Joy Roa. See you in the next Asian Air Safari.